Hello everyone, welcome to the Smooth On Mold Making and Casting Live presentation on painting and finishing your resin castings. My name is Kevin and I've been a painter and an illustrator for over 35 years and a member of the Smooth On team here for a good part of that. Today I'm joined by Jason, our moderator, you may hear his voice, and John, who will be assisting me. Uh, feel free to use the chat to ask questions. Uh, we're going to try our best to answer all of those questions. Uh, if we don't get to your question, uh, submit a ticket and use our customer support, support page in the video description. So today, we will be covering basic painting principles, planning and supplies, visual reference photos for better painting, release agents and painting castings, Painting in layers, a technique I, I like to do. Um, creating base colors for your casting. So you, that's when you're planning ahead. So that's a good, good thing to do. Um, 2D versus 3D painting differences. Uh, some of the similarities, some of the differences. Um, and primers. Uh, you want to prime your casting so uh, the paint adheres better to that piece. That'll create problems down the road if you don't do that. So um, what we're going to do is um, apply traditional painting techniques. Uh, so it could be something like your values. So I have this value chart I did back in art school, believe it or not. Um, your lights and darks of your grays. So when you start your piece, what color is your casting? What, what value is your casting going to be? Is it going to be a mid-tone? Is it going to be darker? Is it going to be lighter? Uh, something to think about when you start. Um, the other thing is chroma, the intensity of your color. I like to paint a more realistic style. Um, so the chroma is the intensity of the color. I like to muddy that, kind of neutralize that. Uh, sometimes what you can do is the opposite of your color wheel and use that paint to try to neutralize that to get a more realistic look. So uh, that works well. Visual reference. Um, I do this for every project. It's easy. You go online, you print out uh, reference materials, images. I put them in a folder, and when I paint, I have that as a, a visual reference. Uh, my illustration teacher back in art school, um, one of his favorite lines, you're only as good as your reference. So, you know, that's very important. Uh, it's going to bring the uh, piece up to a better level. Uh, it's going to look better. Um, planning supplies, before you start painting, obviously your paints, your brushes, your visual reference. Uh, I'm going to use acrylic paints for the most part today. Um, they dry quickly. Um, they work well on the castings. Um, paper towels, rags. Um, you may want a heat gun or a hair dryer to speed up the cure or the drying of the paint rather. Um, and clear coats, are you going to do this layering technique I'm going to talk about? Um, so some coats so that you could spray over that. Um, a final clear coat, uh, some things to consider for your, your supplies. Um, so release agents, I'm going to talk about release agents and how they affect the painting. Uh, if you use a release agent, it can create a, some problems for your painting, and it will create problems. Um, I'm going to talk about layering. So I like to do a technique with thin coats. And I have more control. Uh, I'll, I'll do a clear coat in between the layers. I won't bring up that, that color I already put down. If I like that color, I don't want that to come off. So I'll do a clear coat. Um, 2D versus 3D similarities and differences. Um, so that's something I'm going to cover also. And um, as an example here, I have a casting. It's just a piece of driftwood. And there are dark accents here and lighter areas here. So um, this would be something a difference from two, 2D to 3D. You have to fake that on a flat canvas, where here you already have the, the, the uh, high areas and the low areas. So you add some dark accents, the, the darker colors. In the, in the lower areas, and you could wipe off the paint on the, the higher surfaces, or you could add a, a dry brush technique. So that, that's a neat technique. Uh, that's a, uh, a difference 
Um, another difference is, say a highlight on an eye. Say, say you have an eye, a, a painting. So this is flat art. And uh, what you want to do is have a highlight on this eye. So you uh, just take a little paint here, little white paint. I'll just add a highlight. So now you have a little highlight on there. So uh, that's flat art, where if you're doing three-dimensional art, here's a, an eye. This is actually not a human eye, a dragon eye. Uh, we have a 40-foot dragon in our lobby. And uh, the existing light where you're located is going to dictate where that highlight is. Now here we have a couple lights here for this video, but um, that will dictate where that highlight is. So that's some of the differences there. So uh, this piece right in front of me um, is, a, is a good illustration of urethanes and epoxies. This trout is a urethane resin that was painted. The base here is a epoxy putty that was painted. And uh, I actually caught that fish on a fly rod. So that's a uh, fish I caught. So let me move this out of the way. Okay, so um, what we're gonna, what materials we are discussing today, um, we're gonna touch on smooth cast onyx slow. That's this right here. Freeform air, epoxy putty, uricote, which is a urethane rubber, uh, smooth cast 300, the urethane casting, as well as smooth cast 320. Uh, crystal clear a little bit. I'll, I'll touch base that dragon eye was the uh, crystal clear 202, which is a urethane, a clear UV resistant resin. Um, Urophil 11, which is a filler. Some brass powder and uh, ease release 200, which is a release agent that we use. So um, what I now would like to talk about is release agents and how they affect your castings. Um, it depends on the mold. If you have a silicone mold, you really don't need a release agent. If you know you're going to be painting that piece, this is planning ahead. So um, you would not use a release agent. Um, in the case that you do need a release agent, uh, there is a technique where you can spray the release into that mold, that silicone mold. You can let that dry, and then you could coat that with talc or baby powder and then do your casting. So that's one way you may go. Um, if I know I'm going to be painting a piece, I do not want to use a release agent. Um, if you do have it on a piece and you have to get that off, you can use a um, little soap and water. You can use a mild solvent, such as isopropyl alcohol. Um, some people have success with that. Some people, it's hard to get it off. I've heard of people sandblasting their pieces in order to get that off. So you really want to avoid all that. Um, another thing is you can uh, primer uh, a piece. You can actually spray that in the mold. That's something we'll, we'll, we'll talk about later. And uh, the other thing is having a primer for adhesion. So when you have a casting and you're going to paint on that, um, there are a couple of primers. There's one that is called Bulldog Adhesion Promoter, and we have some info on our website. And this is a clear primer, and you would spray this on your casting, maybe one or two light coats, let that dry prior to uh, painting on that. Now, th this will help the acrylic paint adhere to that casting. You don't want to spend a lot of time painting a piece and having that flake off later and if people handle it. So uh, that's important. Uh, there's, a, there's other different primers out there. We've tested these primers. Plastic coat, sandable primer is one also. And we know that they work. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something very important. So what I'm going to do is a little demonstration here. And what we had was in our mold, we sprayed half of the side with Ease, ease Release 200. And then we casted the smooth on, uh, smooth cast onyx slow into that mold. And uh, 
So what I'm going to do is I have a little white paint here. So what I want to do, just get this out of the way. And uh, what we have here is this casting. So what I'm going to do is put a little paint on here. I have white acrylic paint in this cup here. And I'm just going to apply this here. Just so you can see. Now that's really, uh, you know, that's going on there pretty good, you know. So uh, just hold that up so you can see. And um, what I'm going to do is apply some to the other side now. So you can see a difference here where it really beads up on the side that had the release agent on. So it's very important. Now you could probably go over this once it dries and, and paint over that and get that whiter. Uh, but down the road, that could flake off because it's really not adhered that well. So that, that's an illustration of release agents and how that can present a problem for painting your castings. So, um, let's see. What we're going to talk to talk to you about now is a demonstration. I want to show you some castings here. Now, this is about your base colors. So, these are castings of a bear skull. So, when I was going to paint this bear skull, I was trying to decide which material I want, or which color I want for my casting. This off-white is our Smooth Cast 320, which has a nice bone look to it. This one, which is white, is our Smooth Cast 300. And uh, it's a very white, it'll cast very white. You don't have to add any colors to these two resins. Now the end result, this is planning ahead. I, I didn't want to have to paint the teeth. I wanted the teeth to be white. So what I did is I wanted to have my full value range. So by having the white, I could leave the teeth white and just paint the skull part. So uh, that's what I decided to do. So you can see the difference here. And you can see how those teeth, I didn't have to paint those. I just left that. And uh, I was able to keep more detail. Anytime you paint over a piece, you're putting a little bit of layer on there so you could lose some of that detail. So that really worked out really well for that piece. Hey, so Kev. Um, sure. What kind of acrylic paints do you kind of recommend in general? Um, I know. There's a million brands out there. Is there something that you want to look for with acrylic paints, or do they all perform kind of equally? Uh, I've had a lot of luck with, with this particular acrylic paint, Anita's. Uh, a lot of times I'm painting bigger pieces. I can get the bigger containers. Um, I, you know, I haven't found a big difference in a lot of the acrylics that I've used. Um, so it's the type of thing, if you use it, you get comfortable with that material. So you may have to just play around with that. Right. So that's what I'll typically do. OK, cool. So what I'm going to do next is I want to do this layering technique that I mentioned. So what I want to do is paint. Uh, this is a dragon horn. We have a 40-foot dragon in our lobby, a couple 40-foot dragons. And uh, so I'm going to paint this piece. So. Uh, I'm going to demonstrate how I do the layering technique. And uh, the other thing, like I said, I paint a little realistic. I, I tend to neutralize my colors a lot. Uh, I, I like that realistic look to it. I, I don't like the chrome to be too strong. If you're painting a piece, you don't have to do that technique. You could paint it any color. So this, this technique would work with any color. 
So what I'll do here is show you that I started out, again, trying to decide the 320 or the 300, the white or the off-white. And uh, I opted to go with the white because I could leave the top a little bit lighter. So um, that's what I opted to do. So what I'll do right now is show you a little, take a little paint here. Some brown. A little bit of black. And I think that'll do it a little bit of yellow. So what we have, so what I wanted to do get a, a value that I want. I want a, I want a little shade of a, a little off, um, maybe a bone color from here to here. Just a, a little bit, a tinge of, of yellow. Let me see. Yellow and my white paint. I had some white over here. Actually, I'm going to just take a little tinge of this. Here we go. And then what I'll do is just paint this on here. Just, low, just about halfway and get that in there. And I'll be doing the layering technique on here. So what I'm going to do after I get this painted, I could speed up the cure or the cure the uh, drying on this with a heat gun or a hair dryer, and then continue painting. And then after that, I would take Krylon. Here we go. Krylon Crystal Clear is a product that I use a lot. It's a clear coating, an acrylic coating. It's, uh, you can get it in a matte, you can get it in a satin, or you can get it in a gloss. I like to use the matte a lot. Um, you know, final coat, sometimes I would do a, a gloss depending on the piece. So we've painted that about halfway up, so you can see that right there. So what I did then is this particular piece I sprayed with a clear coat when it was dry, and that's what I have right here. So this is all dry. This, this is that piece. So then what I wanted to do was to add a darker accent even lower here, from here down. So what I did. Take a little black, get a new cup here, a little brown, I want a little muddy. A little bit of water there, and that should do it. It's a little darker than what I wanted. I had a little more water. I can thin that out with water. And I'll kind of just come down here toward the base. I don't want to go completely up. I'm trying to get in these grooves right here. And then again, what I'll do is when this dries, I'll do a clear coat over this. 
And the reason I do that is I won't pull up that previous color. And you can see I'm using water here, so I wouldn't want that to pull up that other color. So I could do that. I could even take a paper towel I'd like to do a lot. Kind of touch that up, get that to go to that edge. Thin this out a little bit more. Just going to work that in there a little bit. I don't want to lose that other color completely. So now I let that dry. So I was happy with that, how that was looking. So like I said, I could have sped up the drying time with the heat gun or a hair dryer. Um, and after that dried, I did a clear coat of the Krylon matte. So Kevin, when you do the Krylon in between, Yep. That just sets the paint for the next layer after? Correct. Okay. This way you won't pull up that previous color. Gotcha. Um, that way if you do, you know, this nice paint job on it, you don't have to rework it all the time. Right. You know? Um, especially, I did a bunch of these dragon horns, and I did almost like a production setup. So I could do one color at a time, and I didn't have to completely do a horn, then go to another horn, completely do it, and mix multiple colors. So um, it was really worked well for doing a production setup. I could do one color at a time, let that dry, spray the clear coat on it, go to the next level, next layer rather. So what I did then, that particular one, again, I have one that's dry. So that's, I did the, the Krylon over this piece. Now what I want to do on this piece is get in these dark grooves and uh, I want to get those accents. So it's going to even be darker. It's going to be less, less water in it. Um, what I'll also do is you know, wipe off the excess off the top, and uh, you'll have the more of that contrast. Uh, just a note, too, this is a smaller piece, uh, so I can do the whole thing. If you're doing a bigger piece um, with the acrylic paint, I wouldn't recommend coating the whole thing with the acrylic and trying to wipe it off then. Uh, acrylic dries pretty quickly. You, you could really darken that piece, and then you're going to have to go opaque lighter to rework it. So do sections at a time, and uh, you'll have more control. So uh, let's see. We'll take this brush again here. And I'm going to take a little more black. And actually what I'm going to do is take another brush a little smaller here so I can get into those grooves a little better. You can see in here. I use my hand a lot to, uh, to move the paint around also. Get that little bit more liquidy. Liquidy, if that's a word. You can see when you bring that out. Now, if this dark edge ends a little bit too sudden, I'll take a little water and I'll just kind of soften that there so it's not so harsh. And again, when, uh, when I'm done with this, this particular piece, I left the tip to be white. 
Um, if I wanted to, I could still go in with the white accents um, down the edge of that. And I'll show you that in a minute, too. I, I, I don't really have to. I planned that I didn't have to. But you always can. You know, there's, if you went over a little bit too much with some of the dark paint, you can go over that. This just gets a little bit of that, so it's a, a little more of a, a gradual transition there. And then I can take a little bit darker here along the base. There's a, a question about the Krylon. Okay. Um, when you apply that, you know, after you've uh, applied the paint, uh, how long do you let that dry normally before you hit it with Do another, another layer? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll let it completely dry. Um, I, I'd say it'd probably only take about 10 or 15 minutes okay. just to be sure. It's pretty fast. Yeah, it is the pretty fast. Yeah. Quick. yeah, yeah. Okay, now this particular piece, I really don't need to add any accents up here. Um, if I wanted to, um, I could show you what I could do is just add a little bit. I'm just going to put some weight in here. Take a little bit of white on here. I don't want it too much on there. And I'll take the side of the brush. So right here, maybe, I just want to show a little difference there. Right here. A little more transition. Maybe even there. I didn't really have to do it, but I always want to improve it. So that's, that's basically the layering technique. I will let this dry completely, or like I said, you could speed up the drying time with the heat gun or a hair dryer. And uh, when that's completely dry, uh, do a clear coat. You could do, like I said, a satin, a matte, a gloss. Um, so that would be uh, that, would be that piece. Um, so that's kind of the layering technique. Now, some people will use shoe polish. Uh, they like shoe polish, and it's kind of effective. Um, it, looks, it looks good. Uh, I, I prefer the acrylic. Um, the shoe polish always is going to have that waxy feel when you handle it. So I just like acrylic paint, probably because I'm a painter. But uh, um, anyway, that is the demonstration for the layering. And what we're going to do is, is go into another demonstration. And another technique that you can do to get paint in, in, onto your casting by actually spraying a paint into your mold. And uh, it's just another technique, and it works very well. So let me just get this here, get these gloves off. All right, what we're going to talk about here is spraying paint into a mold. So here is a mold, and paint was sprayed in here. So um, I believe we have a video that shows the paint being sprayed into here. And uh, you want to make sure when you spray that in, you coat that interior. Uh, it's very important. And. Um, Well, what we'll be doing is mixing a material and casting into that piece. And uh, we won't have to paint the surface then. You can if you want, but we really don't have to. So that was sprayed into the mold. And that was a metallic paint, a gold paint. We used this Rust-Oleum right here. And, uh, See that? 
And there's a lot of different metallic paints. Um, I tried a couple. I like the color that I got with this for a gold bar. So what we're going to do now is you could, you, we're going we're to mix a resin and pour this in, but it doesn't have to be gold. You could do a gray primer. You could do black, whatever, whatever color you want, and you can spray that in, into the mold. Now, this is spraying into a silicone mold, OK? Because that, that paint will not stick to the silicone. So, um, so what we're going to do now is mix up. What we have is a resin called SmoothCast 300Q. The 300Q is very fast. Uh, for certain applications, it's great. and it may be too fast for other applications. Um, it has a 30-second pot life. So when I say it's quick, it's very quick. Uh, we like to recommend double mixes when you're doing material. This material may be tricky to do that. You're just going to have to mix it really well. So what we're going to do is take our A and B uh, of the resin. And we're going to pour that to a hey, bigger cup. Kevin, while you're getting that dispensed out, just a quick question. How long ago did you paint that uh, into the mold? That was actually painted probably a day ago. Okay. So it's been sitting in there for a day. But um, as long as you don't have any, um, anything else in your shop that would contaminate that and get on that, um, I don't think you're going to have an issue. I think it should bond fine. But I, I do let the paint dry. Um, so that's important. You don't want it wet. So here we go. We're going to mix this. I got to do this quickly here. There's a 30 second pot life. So get the sides here and the bottom. And then what I'm going to do is pour this in. thin stream here. Now, this is a resin 300Q that is going to cure white. You can color the material if you want. Uh, this, if it's white, you're limited, but there are other resins that you can color. Our uh, SmoothCast 325 would be one. Um, this will cure up pretty quickly. It's, uh, like I said, a very fast. And then you want, don't want to demold that, demold that too quickly. It's going to be very hot. So um, you have to let that cool down. But what we have over here is one that we already did a casting of. So it's another mold for a gold bar. So I'll show you. This was the 300Q that we poured in here. So we'll just demold this. And you can see how it gets that detail. Um, Look at the sheen of that and all the detail that uh, you would get in, into that, um, that gold bar. Hey, and Kevin, when you painted that mold, you didn't put a release in there first, right? Because that's a silicone mold. You just painted correct. the paint in directly. Correct. Okay. Correct. And you can see how that kicked pretty quick, the, uh, the 300Q. But how that, that, it got all of that gold paint, it just bonded right to that resin. And so it's a really neat effect. And like I said, you could do that with a gray paint, a black paint, whatever. You spray that in a silicone mold. So uh, that's kind of a cool thing. Now, this, this is probably set already. Um, it's going to be a little hot to demold. See? That cures pretty quickly, you know? I don't know if I could pop that out. Now, I think it's a little hot right now, so uh, I'm just going to put that aside. But what we have here is the finished piece. So that's doing a paint into a mold. So uh, that's a neat technique. And what we'll do is go on to another piece here. Let me just move these out of the way quickly.
And the next piece, what we're going to do, to show you, is another technique that it's called cold cast. You've probably heard about cold cast. Um, a lot of sculptors cold cast bronze, and they they do a you know a piece, and it's a you know, it looks great, and it's a, it's a bronze, right? Well, cold cast bronze uh, or any you know, brass, you could do cold cast brass, copper, nickel, silver. They're real metals. So the difference is it's not solid. So you're going to mix that with a resin, and that's going to be the outside of that piece. So it's not solid. And uh, it's real metal powder. So um, you could take steel wool and, and rub that on there and bring up that color, that sheen. So it's, it's kind of really a neat effect. Um, what we have here is a brass powder flask, and, uh, which was an antique. And uh, this is the piece. This is, actually, um, this is actually a painted casting cold cast. So um, you can get it to look pretty realistic. And uh, it, it's kind of a neat effect. So what we did, there are two techniques for doing the cold cast. So one of the techniques is you just put powder into your mold. This is a two-part mold. I'm just going to show you on either side the two techniques. Um, whatever technique I did, once I did that, I closed this mold and poured the, the, the casting. Um, but I already had the metal powder on the, the outside of it. So this is just a, a basic resin. This side, what I did was just powder it. So what I did, I'll show you right now. I'll take a brush here. This is brass powder. Uh, it's real metal powder. And uh, you could take this and you just brush this into. So you're just powdering on that mold. So what we do, we just put this in, and and that's that one technique for doing that. Now, a better technique that's more effective is doing one part A of your resin to one part B of your resin to one part of your powder. So it's one to one to one ratio. And uh, so what we're going to do is just show you how you do that for this particular piece. So this was just brushed in as powder. And this one, which is this, we're going to do one to one to one. And like I said, this one, that's what we did on this piece. Um, this side, I didn't use the steel wool. The reverse side, I did. And you can see that, had that sheen. And uh, it worked really well. So what we have here, move this aside, just give myself a little room here. Is our one to one to one. And I am going to mix this and just show how you brush that into the mold. This resin is smooth cast onyx fast. There's a slow and a fast. Uh, it has a two and a half minute pot life. Um, it's nice to use darker resins, either try to match the color of the metal or the darker, adds more depth to it. So I'm going to put this one part in. I'll put the other part of the resin in here. And then what I'm going to do is mix this. I want my resin really mixed well. So I'll do that first, scrape the sides, the bottom. Really scrape that pretty good. We can use a bigger stick here. 
And then what I'm going to do is put this powder in. So I'll mix this a little as I'm going. It's going to thicken it up. So yeah, it's a little bit thicker. So you just got to mix that really well because it'll settle out. The metal powder is heavier than the resin. So you really want to do that well. Then I could even pour this in. It's going to be thicker. And then you can brush this on the other parts. And then what you would do is when that sets, for this two-part mold especially, I would let that kind of set. I would put that together with the other part of the mold, and then I would pour the, the rest of the, the resin, and I wouldn't have to use the metal powder in that. Uh, I could use uh, just a regular resin. If it was a bigger piece, you could do foam behind it, and uh, you don't have to use as much material. Um, especially with the foam, you, you could utilize that, the expanding foams. Um, so that's, that's a neat technique. Um, the metal powders, uh, there are other powders called Cast Magic. That you, there's other effects that you can do. But I just want to touch a little on this and uh, to show that, that there, it's another technique that you can do. I could paint over this, which I'm going to show you. Um, let me just move this aside. This particular piece, I'm going to paint over. So just get a couple cups here, and I'll show you. Here's a good question, Kevin. OK. Going back to when you powdered the mold first. Sure. Um, because this is a silicone mold, correct. you don't need any release. And the surface of the mold, it can hold the powder, correct? Uh, yes. on, the, on the vertical sides. It can. Okay. Yeah, 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 it can. Remember, it's a very thin coating when you just do the powder. So one of the negative parts about that is if you want to use steel wool on that, you could actually, because it's so thin, when you rub that, you can go right down to the plastic, so to the resin, and you would lose that effect. Um, this particular piece, when I did this, I, I actually didn't really... Um, use the steel wool on this because I wanted it to look old. I didn't want that shiny look. So that worked well for this. Um, I'm just going to do a, a little demonstration on this, painting this, and uh, you can see then the, the both sides. This where I, I didn't really polish it um, with the, uh, or not polish, uh, steel wool it. Um, so let's see. Here's, here's some brown. And then I have some black. And then I have a green. I like green a lot. Green, uh, likes to, it's good for neutralizing a lot. Like I said, I like to paint a lot of stuff realistic. So uh, I, I, I use green a lot anyway. Um, I'll use this brush here. So I am going to get Kind of another muddy color. I, I, I like that realism. Some browns, some blacks, some black in there. I'm going to use just a little bit of green. I think that's too much. Mm -hmm. and need a little bit more. Yeah, that has a nice look to it. So I add just a tiny bit of water. I'm going to show you so what you could do with this. Now, like I said, I, I don't work over a big area, especially something with detail like this. So I'll put that on. And then when you wipe that off, it just has a really neat effect. I'll come 
back to that, but I want to get this in into these grooves. I know when I, when I use paper towel to wipe off the excess, um, because I want to leave it in the recesses, I don't use a rag as much. Rags are softer. They're going to get into the grooves. Uh, I'll take a paper towel and just fold it. So I want more of a flatter surface. So especially for this, I want to keep those ridges. So you can see how that, that pops. It just has a really neat effect. And I'll do a little on the other side just to show that difference. You could also cut some of the bristles down if you have deep recesses to get those in those areas. It's another technique. So I'm just trying to get this in these areas here. Again, I'll take the paper towel, I'll fold this, and then wipe that off. Another paper towel here, a cleaner one. That basically demonstrates technique there with the uh, metal powder and using the uh, paper towel just the sides of it so uh, it's interesting because I know some people do use shoe polish but if you use shoe polish um, it's wax it is. so if you try to clear coat it afterwards that would a be problem. a problem with the acrylic you could hit that with Krylon if you're you doing something for outdoor or something like that yeah you definitely could you, you uh, um, do a clear coat and probably maybe a mat. You, you, that's where you, it, the end product, the mat or a satin or a gloss, whatever you feel would look better. So, uh, so that's that demonstration there for the uh, cold cast. Um, it's kind of a neat technique. So uh, you could, like I said, leave that like that or paint over it. So let me just move this aside here. And what we're going to do is get into some epoxies. And uh, epoxies are pretty cool. We have some different materials. Um, different epoxies. Um, I'm going to do a demonstration with uh, an epoxy that's called freeform air, which is a, a putty. And it's very soft. It's an A and B putty. You mix it together. One's a, a white, one's a gray. You get a consistent color, and you would press that into, into a mold. So um, show you a couple pieces here. Um, we have some freeform air. Uh, actually, I want to show you this piece initially that I had out here. And um, this base was done with freeform air. So, um, you know, it's a really neat material. Um, and there are some other epoxies. I'll just touch real quickly. Um, something called Habitat FR. And uh, this can be applied right on PVC. So, uh, um, and this can be colored also. And, that, and that's a putty. Uh, real benefit for zoos, that type of thing. It's fire rated. Uh, this particular piece, I wanted to hide something on it. so. I did a little thumb drive in there. So uh, it's kind of a neat little piece. And 
they were putties, but we also have um, our habitat casting coat, which you could pour into a mold, so you can cast into that. This is uh, fire rated also. Um, this particular piece, I just added some darks into this fossil, into the lower areas. I left the existing color of the piece as the higher, uh, the lighter areas. So I could have went and did a dry brush on the higher areas, but I kind of liked the look of it. So I left it like that. So that's something that um, is a pretty cool material also. Um, now the freeform air, um, you can apply that. That's used for support shells. Uh, it's a really great material. Uh, this particular piece, we, it was sculpted um, on top of a piece of foam. And uh, very lightweight, and then it was painted. Uh, I, I like freeform air because it has filler in it, and, and it's a, more of a porous material. I could do light washes, and that's what I did with this piece. Light washes over that, and that's a real advantage because you don't, you're not going opaque, so you're not, you're not covering up any detail. And uh, so anytime you can do the lighter um, versions of that, you have more control, number one. And number two is you retain a lot of the details. So, uh, you know, that's uh, kind of a cool thing. And uh, let's see, I have, talking about freeform air, this was applied over a armature. It looks like some wire here and some burlap with probably a, a laminating epoxy or epoxamite. Um, then the freeform air was applied on here and a, uh, a stamp, a silicone stamp that had tree texture was pressed into that to create the texture and then it was painted. And here even some lichen was painted on and we have even attached some lichen. And uh, I mean, this is a smaller piece. You could scale this up. Um, you could make a, a complete tree. It could be a 30, 40, 50 foot tree and it can have a big circumference. And uh, these putties work great for that. So, uh, um, and there is a version of the freeform air that's fire rated also. So uh, very cool. So what I'm going to do now is just talk a little bit about the, the freeform air. And this was a mold, was our Mold Star 16, which is a very fast silicone, platinum silicone. I made a mold of the bank near a stream where there were rocks and pebbles, that type of thing. And uh, after that cured, I cleaned that all out. And I took the freeform air, the putty, and I pressed that into this mold. And uh, this particular piece that was, that was pressed in, I let that cure, it's a 16 hour cure, and took that out. And that's that detail you get. So um, then I painted this. This is this piece right next to me, the trout base. You can see that right there. So uh, it's a great material. Um, actually, a lot of us here at Smooth Down, we use this all the time. We love this material. So uh, that's your freeform air. So what I'm going to do now is what we have is a, a dragon head. It's a section of a 40-foot dragon that uh, we we created for our lobby. And uh, so this is uh, just a section of that. I actually did a, a test, so uh, I was painting it. Jonathan, could you bring that over? So this is the uh, just section of the head. And uh, I do believe we even have uh, some video that, that, that shows the lobby and uh, you know the scale. And uh, it was just a very cool piece, you know? and. Uh, and that entire dragon, I painted that dragon. I mean, a lot of my coworkers, it was a real team effort. It, it came out really great. Um, it's a big piece. And uh, we had a fun time working on that. 
And you can see the colors in there. So it's an ice dragon um, and uh, just very cool piece. So what we have here is the section of that head. And uh, this is the casting, freeform air. Then uh, that material was pressed into this mold. And uh, this is silicone mold. And I actually used platinums. Uh, I didn't want to waste it, so I had some dragon skin I used. I used some Mold Star 16. They're both platinums. They're compatible. And I didn't want to waste any material. And uh, so this particular piece, I was very happy with that. Uh, as far as my base color, I wanted to have a darker base color. So what I did was take this and just spray painted a, a black primer on this. And uh, so I'll show you. So there we have it. And uh, just a... Uh, a matte black spray paint. And the reason I did that is this has a lot of texture, some dark recesses. Uh, I didn't want to have to paint those in after. That'd be a lot of work. So if I have the black as my base color, I'm going to do a dry brush painting technique on this where I, I try not to get it in those grooves. So that's going to save me a lot of work later. If I have to go in and touch up a couple areas, I can. but. Um, that's what I opted to do with this. And uh, I really didn't even use an adhesive primer for this. Uh, the Freeform Air, the, the paint actually works really well with it. So I didn't have to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is, before I paint this, I just want to do a demonstration really quick showing you the technique for the Freeform Air. So uh, what we have here is some freeform air. So a good way that we do this is mix up these, these balls that, of the material that are easy to handle. So they're easy to mix together. So uh, your A and B. And what you want to do is get a consistent color. So um, you just mix this in your hand. It's very soft. It's easy to manipulate. And you just keep kind of twisting that until you get a consistent color. You don't see any differences. And uh, so what I'm doing here, you can see that. There's still some differences there. We don't want that. So take it just a minute here. And then I'm going to press this into this mold. That's the technique I did for that trout base. And uh, freeform air, it's an epoxy, They're very adhesive. So you could add more to it later. So say you press this in, and uh, you, know, you said, oh, I think it's a little thin in a certain area. Um, just mix a little more and put it on top of it. It has a 16-hour cure. And uh, so here I have a pretty good consistent color. So what I could do is just take this and press this. Press this in. Kevin, have you sure. ever uh, pigmented the freeform air? I know you can do it. You can do it. Um, yeah, it, it's a little messy. Um, you could use our colorant, uh, So Strong, or the Uvo, I believe, works also. Um, it's kind of messy. I, I just, uh, for the applications I've done, uh, the projects, it was just easier to spray paint it or, pa or paint it by brush. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just figured, you know, that would be easier and faster to do. So I'll just mix up one more here, one or two more, and just show you. I'll just do the end. I'm not going to do the entire piece, just so you get an idea. here. And actually, you can see this mold, the support shell is freeform air. So, uh, you know, it could be used for, like I said, support shells. A lot of times it's used for support shells. It's lightweight. It's rigid. 
Uh, if you're doing a very big piece, sometimes you'll do the freeform air, and then you could even uh, do some uh, epoxamite, which is a laminating epoxy with some fiberglass on top of it. Add a little strength to it if you're worried about it possibly cracking. If it's a very long piece or a really big piece, just a little added strength. So what we'll do is just add a little here. Just do this end right here. The other thing that you can do is take a little water and you can smoothen this material. So uh, if it cures up, so there. So I could even just dip my hand there in some water. It's a little dirty there, that water with the paint doesn't really matter. And then just smoothen that. And then later you could, you could file this, you could sand it, you know, wear a mask, you don't want to breathe that. Um, and uh, you could drill in it. So, uh, I mean, it's a really great material. So, uh, And we have a variant of that which is fire safe as well, if you're doing theming stuff. Correct. Yeah. The, the fire safe is great for like zoos, uh, for theming. And uh, yeah, that, that's just a great material. Um, like I said, I know a lot of my coworkers here, we use this material all the time. This is a great material. So uh, I'll just do those two, show you that. So that's how that was done. That's how that trout base was done. And after this cured for 16 hours, it was just demolded. So you take your support shell off, and then you could easily take the silicone that was brushed on and uh, take that off that piece. So now I have the black casting. So I just want to show a little bit here of doing a dry brush technique. So dry brush, when you're painting, um, you just can't have too much paint on that brush. So the idea here is not to get it in all the grooves. So what, I'll, what I typically do, get that uh, paint on my brush, and then I use like a paper towel or a table, you know, piece of paper, and I, and I go across that and take some of that paint off because I don't want too much. It's, it, it, it would get in, get in all those grooves. So what I have here, here is some paint, some Liquitex. So I, here is a different one. Someone asked earlier about different paints. So uh, let's see here. Um, that's pretty good. So what we'll do is just put a little paint, a couple of cups here. I'm going to start with this blue. I kind of like this blue. This royal blue here is a little darker, so I'll probably use that in some of the darker accented areas with a little black. Like again, I like to neutralize things. Just a little black. And then I'm going to take a little white. right there. So what I'm going to do, I'll put this down in front just to show you here what I typically do. So I'll take this paint. Like I said, I have a lot of paint on there. Now I want a dry brush, so I don't want it too wet. So then what I'll do is kind of take that much on there. And you can go over this initially. And just so you know, this eye, what I did with that eye, that eye I showed you earlier, that was used in one of the dragons. So what we could do is later, I'll cut that out insert that eye, and even use a little air to try to fine tune it.
to use acrylic most of the time. I mean, there are other painters out there that I'm sure use other techniques or paints and they have success, which is great. Um, the years I've been doing this, I've had a lot of success doing these techniques. So, uh, so let's see here. So I kind of, I'll fill that in a little bit, but I do want to retain some of that. do is add a little white. I want some little lighter areas here. So say I want this a little lighter here. It's not dry enough. I want this a little lighter up here also. And I didn't do a uh, layering technique on this because I wanted the paint to kind of blend a little with the other paint. So uh, could I have done that? Yeah, but I, I did want this to blend a little. That goes on your higher spots there. And you really have to kind of play around with this to get A little too much dark areas there. If you do cover up too many of those dark areas, you'll go in with a maybe a wash to get in there afterwards. If you need I to could, I up. could, I could take a smaller brush and uh, with some darker, like black, and kind of accent those areas. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'll typically do that with a lot of pieces. Uh, when you get the, the brunt of the piece painted, you get a better overall look on the piece and, and see areas you can uh, add some dark accents or maybe some lighter areas also. So uh, I'm doing this quickly. You know, th this would normally take me a little bit longer. Let's see, Here's a, now if I use a little black with this other blue, I know a lot of people um, have been kind of asking what happens if it gets too dark or what happens if it gets too light. Um, those are just adjustments that you have to make afterwards, start going the other direction. You do, you do, but if you plan ahead, um, a lot of times you can avoid that because what will happen is the more you go over a piece, you're gonna lose some detail. I mean, you can paint the detail in, um, but um, if you, for a three-dimensional piece, if you have the texture, you want to utilize that to your benefit. So, uh, um, but you could always go and fake it, and you can go in and, and paint. And uh, if you have to, if uh, you say you went too dark or too light, like you said. So I'm just going to do a little bit more here, and and uh, use a little bit different color to get in there. Now what I'm going to do is just add some lighter areas here. Get a different brush. So if I wanted to get that real light accents. It's just giving you a rough idea here. Get a little more dry on that brush there. So I can, I use, like to use the side of the brush a lot when you're doing the dry brush technique.
pick up that texture. This is a lot lighter up on this top, so we want to really accent this. Here's an interesting question about um, when you did do the layering process. Okay. You're applying really, really light layers of the clear. Yeah. Like a dust. Not, you know, when you start putting it on really thick, you start to get clouding. Uh, uh, you mean the paint? No, the, uh, the, um, the clear. Oh, the cry line? Yeah, I yeah. usually do just do a light coating. Yeah. Uh, one or two very light coatings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that can affect the detail. You're right. That's a good question. And uh, the layering technique, like I said, I really like is you have a lot of control. Um, and because you're working in thinner layers, you're, you're retaining some of that detail. Mm -hmm. Even though you're doing the Krylon over that, you still have a lot of control. Mm -hmm. So uh, that works well. All right, th this is pretty much just showing a little here with the dry brush technique. So, uh, you know. Like I said, that eye will eventually come out. And uh, like I said, we have, it was a different color scheme, but uh, that eye would be cut out and this would be put in from the back. So that, that really pretty much covers the freeform air and, uh, and this demo. And the next demonstration I'm gonna do is gonna be using paint to paint something that's flexible because that can be a challenge. And uh, what we have is a uh, material called Uricoat, and it's a urethane rubber, uh, just a really cool material that you can paint on, say, like a flexible foam, and uh, it's good for uh, being flexible. Um, if you were to paint acrylic paint on a flexible foam, it's gonna crack and fall off, so it just wouldn't work. So, um, let's see, I could use these gloves. So, what we're gonna do is show you a vine. We're gonna make a vine, and uh, zoos could do this, uh, museums, so this material is great. Uricote, um, like I said, is a urethane rubber. Uh, the cool part about it is you can thicken it uh, with our Eurofill 11, and that's what I did initially with this. And um, this is just a basic, you know, buildup of a, a, a thicker area. There's no texture on this yet, and I'll show you what I did to add some texture. I wanted it to look more organic, and, and this was planning ahead too. I, I did like a, a mid-value range, because I want to create some grooves in this, and I wanted darker accents in the grooves. So I knew I wanted to do that in the beginning. So if I made this too dark, it wouldn't work. So um, that's what I opted to do. So here you go, John. Thank you. And what I'm going to show you now is that after I did that, what I did was use the tool. When this material was still soft, what I did was take had a stick. Oh, here it is. A mixing stick, and I just cut some grooves in it. And uh, what I did, because this material um, only has an eight minute pot life, and so you can only really paint with one color at a time. Now, um, what I did was my initial colors on here, you can actually thin this with mineral spirits. So you can do washes of colors. Uh, but just keep in mind that that eight minute pot life, you, you have to be aware of that. What you could also do is uh, make a tray or something that you can um, extend your pot life a little so it doesn't, it, it's mass sensitive, so it doesn't cure too quickly. So you can extend your pot life if, if you pour instead of a, a cup where it's thicker, you pour it in a tray. So you could use a tinfoil tray, uh, something similar like this or like this, 
And because it's flatter, it's going to extend that uh, polyp. It's not going to cure as quickly. And it gives you more time to work with the material. Uh, for this demonstration, I'm just going to do it in, a, uh, in the cups because um, it's not a lot of material. So uh, what I'll do here is this is uh, my A and B. And this material is a 100A to 10B uh, by weight using a gram scale. So you would need a gram scale with this material. And um, I pre-dispense this. So what I'm going to do is just color. And uh, when I color this material, I know what I want. I want something very dark to get in these accents. So uh, that's what I was saying about the, this, the, when I, this tool that I made. I cut these grooves. When this was still soft, I just went down this and I created these grooves because I, I wanted to have darker accents in those areas. So, uh, and then that cured. So what I'll do now is go over with a darker color to get in those grooves. And I'll show you how I'll do that. I have uh, some so strong black and brown. And um, that's probably what I'll need for these two. So what I will do is color this. I'm going to put brown in first here. I just want to get a good idea of the color here. Actually, I'm going to use a bigger stick. It's going to be easier. And that's too brown. So I just want to add a touch of black. And I'm just going to put a little bit very concentrated material. That wasn't enough, though. That's pretty good. Now, like I said, I always like to neutralize things a little. So I have a little bit of so strong green. And I'm just going to use a little bit. Because if you use too much, it's going to be too green. I don't want that. Just put a little bit in there. See if that neutralizes. It's actually a little browner that I and I really wanted, which would work for this. I'm going to put just a little bit more black in. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's better. I wanted that door. OK, now I am going to add the other part. Try to get as much out here so I have a good mix ratio. Like I said, you have about eight minutes. If I was doing a, a real big piece, some people do vines uh, for zoos, that type of thing. They, they could be doing. 50 foot ones or, or larger, longer. So uh, probably have multiple people working on those. OK, so what I'm going to do here is just brush this on. And I'm going to start on the top. And I'm going to try to just get it in these grooves. Just go try to get it in those grooves. Spin this around if I have to. Start on the top. I'll let gravity work with it. Yeah. 
And Kevin, if you wanted to thin this out, you'd use? Um, you could use mineral spirits to okay. thin this out. And uh, you can control how, how thin you want it. So, uh, um, you know, you could mix different percentages um, of the uh, mineral spirits in with that. And uh, that's a good technique when you're done with the piece and you can do very thin washes. So if you want to get a tin of a color and uh, suggest a color, I like to do that. Just almost done here with this. And then I'll show you how we get those ridges to show up. Try to make sure we get that in all those grooves. There we go. That's pretty good, I think. I'll just spin it around here, see if I missed any spots. All right, so the technique I'll do for here is to just use a wooden mixing stick and uh, like other pieces you're wiping off the high areas and you're going to retain the dark accents then so you could take this down and you can see it's going to bring those up so you're taking that material off of those high areas you can go back into this and work those areas a little bit Here, you want to bring that out. And what I'll do is take a paper towel, just take some of that excess off of that. And obviously, wearing the gloves here, uh, wearing vinyl gloves with this material, which is a smart thing to do. You don't want to get that on your hand. This is urethane rubber. So that kind of shows how you can get that. If you were to use a rag or paper towel on this, it would be too soft, and it's going to get into the grooves. So you'd be pulling out some of those darker accents, and you don't want to do that. So like the same thing when I was folding up the paper towel for the brass uh, powder flask, uh, same idea. You just want a flatter surface. So that pretty much shows that pretty well. And now what I'll do is just mix another little color. I just want to add just maybe a tinge of green. So what I'll do is mix this again. And I'll just take a little bit of green. Get the green first. Actually, this would be a good illustration, too, showing the, the, I mentioned the chroma, so the intensity, that green. Look at that. I don't want to put that on. That just would not look realistic. Um, it, it's too strong. The chroma is too strong. So I'm going to kill that chroma. I'm going to neutralize it. Basically, just muddy that a little bit. So I'll take a little bit of brown. Do a little at a time, because if you do too much, it's hard to go back. You'll have to uh, add white, and then you're going to be really fighting that. So a little at a time. So that, that looks better. That's a better green color. Yeah, I kind of like that. I think I'll go with that. Mix the other material here, my A and B. that really well. 
And with this, I'm only going to add a little bit of color here and there, just to, to suggest a little green in there. So it just looks a little bit more realistic. Take a little of this green. So say I'll add a little in here. Just a little bit. suggest that. And it, you know, you can do different types of color schemes for this. So, you know, it could just be a brown one. It could just be uh, just mostly green. Uh, it depends what you want to do. You're the artist. So that's that. That's your coat. Um, the just want to mention too the your coat. The um, it's flexible, and that's the real big benefit. So this skull uh, was done with our one of our flexible foams. So it's 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 very flexible. Uh, like I said, if you were to do acrylic paint, it would just crack right off. So your coat was painted on this, and. Uh, so uh, I just did a couple different coats. Um, this material you would let cure overnight. And um, there is a technique I'm going to show you in a little while um, to, if you want to, if you want to ha have a matte look, it's going to cure with a gloss to it. So this particular piece, I wanted the gloss on the top, but on the skull part, I wanted more of a matte look. So you can use powdered sugar, and I'll show how that works. So that, that's kind of a neat thing. Um, the other thing with Uricoat, it's good for like museums like it. If they're doing an interactive piece, say kids are going to be handling something. And so it's safe, you know, if they drop it or, or what have you. This particular piece, this rock, was foam that was just carved in foam and then coated with Uricoat. And it, it's a flexible material. So uh, it's a good interactive piece. So that, that would be kind of a, it's, a, it's really a, a good material for that application. Um, now what I'm going to do is demonstrate the uh, powdered sugar. I'll just get these gloves on because I'm going to be doing a little bit of an application here. Um, so you just use powdered sugar. Now, initially when we did this, um, I was using it with a brush. And it's got a little messy um, trying to brush that on something like this. So what I opted to do, thank you, John, was use um, the powdered sugar in a sock. And uh, let me just show you. So you could pat that. Um, now, it's at a certain time when this is curing, when it's still tacky is the best time to do it. But you could just pat this. And you have a lot more control with the powdered sugar. And that will mat the piece. And when you do that, when you're done with the powdered sugar, getting all the glossy areas, you would just let that uh, cure overnight. And the following day, uh, just run that over warm water. And uh, you'll, you'll have your matte look because it won't hurt anything. So uh, what I'll do is just show you matting this on here. So I'll just start at the top here a little bit. And it's still a little tacky, so, but uh, I'll just show you to demonstrate. It's, it's really, you would want to wave a little bit longer, but it could just, it's still able to show you here how that works. So that's, that's a little bit too tacky, but, um, but that's that um, application for the Eurocoat. 
And uh, I'll show you, I have a finished piece, John. This vine, uh, a little bit different color scheme, uh, a little bit of a green to it. Um, it's a little bit longer. This is actually done on um, steel cable, so it, it has a lot of strength to it. Um, so you could do this, like I said, this is about five foot long. You could do 50 foot long, 100 foot long, uh, zoos, um, museums like to use this material. It's a great material. Um, so that Eurocoat, it's great for painting on flexible surfaces. Um, so that's a really good material. One thing I did want to mention that I forgot to earlier is um, your reference, your photo reference. And um, what I have here, we've done, we've done some large pieces, uh, small pieces rather, but you can do a lot of large pieces. Uh, typically, when I do a project, I go online, I get my reference material, I print it out, get a folder. So here, there was a T-Rex skull, or not a skull, a T-Rex uh, fossil. And I went online, I just got some reference materials, some different color schemes, and uh, it, it just helped me when I'm painting. So, John, do you have that piece? Just to show you the scale, we can do large pieces also. So, um, this is a T-Rex skull. So this was painted. Now, when I painted this also, I did sections at a time. Uh, if I didn't want it to dry too quickly, especially the dark accents. So uh, it worked really well. And uh, so you can do small pieces as well as very large pieces and uh, use the same technique. And uh, I think I, I did do the layering technique on this also. So uh, I had a larger area to work in and it worked out great. Thank you, John. What's that piece made out of? That, that particular piece is a rigid foam, so it's very lightweight. You can see how we handled that. Um, and that worked out great. A mold was made of that, and uh, foam was casted into that, a rigid, lightweight foam. And uh, it worked out great. Um, so to review real quickly um, what we discussed today, painting and finishing resin castings, your, your basic painting principles, um, planning, um, your supplies, visual reference I just showed you, um, release agents and how they affect painting, painting and layers, I show you that technique, creating a base color when you're starting your piece, two-dimensional versus three-dimensional, some of the differences, some of the similarities, um, primers, uh, for better adhesion, or just to spray it into your, your mold to get a base color. We showed that also. So I want to thank you all for watching today. And don't forget, our next event is going to be on the Buddy Rhodes Vertical Mix on February 18th. You don't want to miss it. It's a very cool material. Um, we'll also be announcing further events on social media and um, our email newsletters or on YouTube channel. Um, so don't forget to subscribe, sign up, or follow us. And um, you know, thank you again for checking in today. Hopefully this information will be helpful for you. Thank you.